Throughout the series, the gang included one resident fat boy, the first of which was little Joe Frank Cobb, who added greatly to the individuality of the early group. Joe stayed with the gang for seven years, returned as a teen for three cameo appearances, and remained short even as an adult, about five feet tall. J.R. Smith, Nicky Daniels' freckled replacement. He was the closest, my closest friend in the gang. Of course, we were, I think, close to the same age, and we had uh, similar likes. Young Joe was deeply hurt by the death of his mother, and a number of friends from the Roach lot looked after him, including photographer Art Lloyd and his wife, Dennis, shown here in this rare home movie. The story seemed to always call for Joe and I to be sweethearts. And so Joe was always trying to give me a sucker or something in getting my favor for a kiss in return. And uh, they were always, we were always paired together. Howdy faced Jackie Condon joined the gang at the very beginning. Like Joe Cobb, he stayed for seven years. Both boys were featured in our gang personal appearances after they outgrew their roles, and later they worked together as adults outside of show business. Oh, Jackie Condon was a friend, my favorite of, of all. I can't say favorite, I loved them all, but he was closer to our family. And uh, Jackie was always the little gentleman. And when we made personal appearances, he was the one that would open the door for me or hold out the chair for me to sit down and let me go first. And I, that, I was impressed with that. He wet his pants every so often. <laughs> J.R. Smith had already been with the gang for a year when Mickey Daniels departed in 1926. His red hair and freckles made him a natural to step into that general role. Oh, J.R. Smith. Well, he was the cut up. <laughs> I recall Jay was always, uh, J.R. was always having uh, somebody have to say, don't touch that, J.R. Watch out for that. <laughs> but Jr. was Jr. was a cut up. I don't ever remember any real problems. Or petty things. The parents are the ones that cause the problems. <laughs> oh, jealousy, you know. And uh, you take more close-ups of him than you are my kid. And and I hear him tell the kid, uh, you know, stand out in front, get out in front, you know. And, by mid-1925, the kids were beginning to mature, and other new faces included Johnny Downs, who frequently played the bully. Downs would later play boy-next-door type roles and remained lifelong friends with Mary Cornman. The following summer, Mickey Daniels left the group and created that void which was felt throughout the silent era, despite experience and enthusiasm of the rest of the gang. For the first few years, producer Hal Roach had taken an active role in the various facets of producing the series, but by now he was devoting more time to developing the new Laurel and Hardy series and more relaxing activities such as his polo ponies and trips abroad. And less attention was being paid to the gang by director Bob McGowan. He was a former fireman who moved out to Hollywood from Denver after being injured on the job. He joined Roach as a gag man in 1921 and the following year was assigned to the gang as its first director under producer Charlie Chase. The kids loved him. He made work a game and related easily to the children. But he was dividing his time among other projects when health problems would permit. Beginning in 1927, much of the director's chores went to his less talented son, Robert A. McGowan Jr., who used the name Anthony Mack. For the most part, Mack's films were inferior to the ones directed by McGowan. He didn't have the understanding of comedy, nor the ability to deal with kids. When I was rolling his pool ball on one end of the table and the chicken was on the other end and they were trying to get the camera and everything set up and Anthony Mack was directing at this time, Bob McGowan was on vacation and uh, of course he had a short fuse and he wasn't as patient with us children as Bob was. But he told me to quit playing with the pool ball and of course uh, I did for a few minutes and then just about in the middle of taking the picture of the chicken I rolled the ball and it hit the side and roll back, scared the chicken and broke the egg and of course he lost his temper and said, Jay, you're fired. Smith was retrieved and stayed with the gang for a total of four years. But there were some new faces including Harry Spear, Gene Darling and Farina's younger sister, Jane Hoskins, who was known as Mango. Gene Darling was the blonde sweetheart in the Mary Cornman tradition and made the transition to talkies with the gang. She later toured with our gang's vaudeville show and as an adult made the Broadway stage her home. 
By the end of 1927, Roach switched distribution from poorly managed Pathé to MGM, where the series had problems for a year until pictures began to talk. And just in time, for there was a new set of bright kids emerging from the ranks, including Mary Ann Jackson and little Bobby Hutchins, Weezer. At first it was music and sound effects, then dialogue and fascination. Shortly after sound films emerged, Bob McGowan returned to his directoral duties with the gang. And there was one more thing that happened. Well, anyway, you was in a terrible rage today. And well, mate. And well, mate, we all tremble in our pants. Jackie Cooper. <laughs> Just a few short months after motion pictures began to talk, Jackie Cooper found a home. Hal Roach knew he had found a central character for the gang, one who was unaffected, genuine, and natural. Cooper was seven and a veteran of silent and sound comedies. He was younger than his usual cohorts, Farina, who by now had grown into talkies, and 11-year-old Norman Chebby Cheney, who stood less than four feet tall and weighed 113 pounds. Roach cast Cooper as the good little bad boy, the one with the ideas that usually cause the trouble. He appears at ease on film in scenes like this with Edgar Kennedy, the perennial cop, apparently a grown-up little boy himself. That was a, 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 a group of kids that, 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 that are real to them, that are alive. No television, no electronics, no computers, no, no uh, all, this, all this electrical and hydraulic world we live in. Uh, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a great escape for them, as well as for the adults who look at it as, as, a, as a kind of an art form that will never be. There was the younger group of kids, too, usually the little brothers and sisters, and at one time or another, little Dorothy de Borba was sister to them all. Her unofficial nickname was Echo. I mimic everybody and I always knew everybody's cue line because of mothers giving me my cues for the previous, you know, the, during the night before for the next day. So little Echo had uh, the habit of doing things like this. But of all the girls, there was none so fair as June Marlowe, Miss Crabtree. Hey, you're pretty. I guess they encouraged a kind of uh, little uh, love affair between uh, Miss Crabtree and me because I had a big crush on her and I adored her. And uh, 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 looking back on it, quite obviously, she, you know, was affectionate with me and this and that so that I would be in front of the other kids as we were supposed to be on the screen, very protective of her and, and trying to hide my crush on her if they kidded me about it or anything like that. All the kids were smitten with Miss Crabtree. Now over there is the clothes closet. Little mischief. Well, well, little man. What is your name? 